you take that one. Oh, good afternoon. Welcome to our Sunday Symposium for Next to Normal. My name is David Kennedy. I'm the Associate Artistic Director here. And I'm really pleased to be doing this live after like a very long hiatus. And I couldn't be happier that the man who's going to help us reboot these Sunday afternoon conversations is Tom Kitt, the composer of Next to Normal. <laughs> He is, of course, a Tony, Pulitzer Prize, and Grammy Award-winning artist. He has multiple Broadway and off-Broadway credits as a composer, including the recent Lincoln Center production of Flying Over Sunset, and many additional credits as a musical director, conductor, arranger, and orchestrator. His long and successful creative partnership with Brian Yorkie, who's the book writer and lyricist for Next to Normal, is responsible for such musicals as If Then, The Visit, and Disney's mu musical adaptation of Freaky Friday. He also has collaborated with Lin-Manuel Miranda, Jason Robert Brown, Alanis Morissette, Cameron Crowe, James Lapine, David Lindsay Abair, and the great American punk band Green Day, among many others. And I'm pleased to welcome him as our guest this afternoon. Uh, I want you to know that Tom and I will talk for a while, and there will be time to ask questions afterwards if you would like to. Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate you on Next to Normal. It must be gratifying to know that this work that's now almost a decade and a half old is still being produced far and wide, and audiences are still loving it. And I, I'm wondering, given the pandemic, I'm assuming this is the first time you've seen it in quite a while. Yeah. Um, whew, this was quite an emotional afternoon, and um, I just want to first say how moving and beautiful this was. Um, I, it's, an, it's an, ex, an extraordinary production, extraordinarily performed, extraordinarily played by that incredible band. Um, it was such a gift. So um, I just am, I'm sort of at a loss of words, as you can tell. Very, very moved. Um, the question was about <laughs> well, how I, I, <laughs> Are you the kind of artist who can uh, sit back and enjoy your own creation? Or is there some part of you that's also like, ooh, that's something I would rethink if I did it now? Or I mean, you know, a lot of artists are very um, self-critical. Yeah, and I still am. <laughs> <laughs> but um, what, what's unbelievable is that um, it's been 24 years that I, I I've been writing, I've been, I've had this piece in my life. Started writing it when I was 24, now half my age. So I've yeah. half, half my life has been with next to normal in it. And so when I, when I see it and I hear it, all of these memories start flooding back about, for any new musical, it's, it's, there's a long road of development and starts and stops and successes and failures. Um, and um, I see a song like aftershocks on stage, um, which is in the second act, when uh, Gabe starts to to reappear, and that was one of the first songs written in 1998. And to just think back to those first impulses, and now seeing it in this moment, um, it's just it's it's truly t unbelievable when something becomes bigger than what you ever thought possible. So, um, and there are things that I forgot that we did, late changes that I'm I'm pleasantly surprised by. And then, of course, these six unbelievable artists who found new things in the material that I experienced for the first time today. Um, and that's why those more crying moments um, than, than before. And um, with Next to Normal, I've always been, um, I've always been able to get outside of it and emote not as the writer of this piece, but as someone who's just moved by the story that Brian Yorkey created and that I got a chance to contribute to, because it was Brian who pitched the original idea. Um, and in his lyrics and his book, there's just so much humanity and truth in the difficulties of the human experience and an incredible resilience and ultimately a connection. Um, and I just find that in this world today, that's more important than ever. In the song, Everything Else, Natalie sings about escaping into music. Mm -hmm. You know, everything else goes away. And I wonder, that's an experience, I think, for a lot of teenagers. I certainly remember escaping into my favorite bands. I'm not a musician, but I would listen obsessively to certain yeah. recordings. How important was music to you as an adolescent? 
very important. And that moment where Natalie is at the piano and she, we hear her inner thoughts, that's taken right from when I used to practice the piano. I remember I would just go into a trance and I'd be playing the Mozart or Bach that I was studying at the time. But, but this whole play would happen in my head. And sometimes I would even just not remember what I played. Um, so music, I, I started playing the piano when I was four, and I started writing music when I was seven. And um, I just knew that um, I, I can't imagine a life without it. And, and I think for, for we artists, there's certainly a lot that we struggle with. But the, the wonderful thing is that we have this outlet. We have something that we can channel what it is we're going through. And hopefully, we can bring other people into that orbit and, and move some needles and help bring about some understanding and clarity to this human existence. Now, I read that you went to Columbia for economics, and I'm wondering, was that? Just a straight path right to musical <laughs> theater. <laughs> what, was, was, I mean, were you sort of on the fence about wanting to pursue a musical career at that point, or was that sort of more to mollify your parents? My mom's here, so. <laughs> <laughs> you can <laughs> You can pass along to dad this answer as well. Um, I, um, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do with music. I knew I wanted to be a musician. I was classically trained. And then when I was, uh, I don't know, I'd say about 12 or 13, I started getting into Billy Joel and the Beatles and Elton John. And I just started playing all of anything piano based in the singer songwriter world. I started to just devour. And I wanted to be a singer songwriter. And uh, going to a school like Columbia was going to um, allow me to be in a place where per perhaps you get discovered one day um, and find that career. But what I didn't plan on was that I was going to meet Rita Kitt, Rita Pietro Pinto, Kitt, Rita Pietro Pinto at the time. Um, and um, we started dating and Rita introduced me to Brian Yorkie and suggested that we start writing musicals together. And I was immediately like, I can't do that. That's, it's hard enough for me to write one song, never mind trying to write 20. But um, I just took to it right away. And with Brian as inspiration, it became one of the great joys of my life. And, um, and that's where I had now two dreams, this desire to maybe be a recording artist and, um, and to write musicals. And luckily, I get to do both. And were you a fan of musical theater growing up? I mean, did you, you, you grew up on Long Island, is that correct? I grew up or? first on Long Island, yeah, and then, yeah. then we moved to the Westchester area. So was going into the city to see Broadway kind of part of your cultural experience growing up? Well, it, early on, it, it was a, a family excursion. It was something that we did for, for fun. And, and, um, and I, I certainly enjoyed the, um, the magic of the theater, but I hadn't really connected as it being a path. And then when I was 16, I studied for a summer at Interlochen, and I saw Cabaret for the first time. And then when I was 18, I was cast in Into the Woods in, in the um, high school musical. And both of those experiences, because those shows really affected me, started to get me thinking about creating for, for this art form. And um, happily, I was able to, to find Brian and, um, and, and find a path. As anyone who's an artist knows, there's no trajectory to, to an and set equation to how you make this life work. You just have to keep gaining every day and finding new opportunities. And, and, and if they open the door a little bit, you have to keep going till you, till you knock it over. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Billy Joel, the Beatles, sort of these artists you idolized. I mean, have they been influences on your composition work as you've moved into musical theater? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, because uh, I'm just a, a fan of, of form and melodic content and songs and songwriting. And um, I think that um, the Beatles, Billy Joel, Elton John, Bruce Springsteen, number of artists, um, uh, you can keep counting on, um, and we all have this this group of, of influences that we, where we come from. Um, there's a theatricality to the writing, um, and um, I just found that um, the nine-minute song on an album that's suddenly a song like Jungle Land, for example, that's so episodic. Um, I, I just wanted to 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 immerse myself in that kind of theatrical sensibility and not be um, boxed in by by any one thing. So um, that also uh, found its way into the piano because I went back to classical music and I started to study um, more 20th century and modern sensibilities. Um, and that was um, definitely a sort of a light bulb moment for me. And I think when I hear Next to Normal, I can hear all of these different influences coming together. Mm. And there are some obvious musical quotations in the piece, Mozart, of course. and. Um Sound of Music. Are there others that are less obvious? I mean, in other words, are there things that 
you could point to that said, you know, that's sort of my Billy Joel interest coming <laughs> out? Or um, I don't know if there's necessarily that that one thing that I would point to to an artist. I mean, I did, I do remember. Um, I was I was musical directing West Side Story um, for the Marymount School, which is where my my wife is the drama chair, and um, they have these piano they have these piano reductions. They basically take the orchestral score and they make it into the piano book, so you can so you can um, uh, accompany the the, sh the the performers with some sense of what the um, of, of what the orchestration is, and it's just it's impossible to play. West Side Story is impossible on itself, but the orchestral piano book. Um, and when I was writing my psychopharmacologist and I, I was like, well, I was doing this kind of thing, so why not put that in the piano book? So I apologize to the musical director <laughs> for those crazy leaps all over the place, but that directly came out of my experience with that show. Right. Now, you did release, an, I think it's an EP, maybe an LP as a singer-songwriter in 2000, Tom Kitt Band. So can you talk a little bit about that? Were you coming out of Columbia still sort of adamant about following that path, even though you had started working with Brian? Yeah, I formed a band, um, and uh, Dave Matthews' band worked really well, so I thought, Tom Kitt Band, why not? They'll just follow in that. <laughs> um, and it was with, um, actually, my good friend Damian Bassman, who I still play with, who created the, the percussion book, the drum book for Next to Normal. We met at Interlock in that same summer, and, um, and we recorded an album. It was called Find Me, and um, I got to a place with the band where we, we were close. We were, we were getting some interest. We were headlining great clubs in New York City, um, some representatives would come out and, and see us, and it never quite caught. And um, and then uh, I just sort of the, the theatrical part of my life was really felt like that was taking off. Um, but uh, circle back now to 2020 in the pandemic, I was able to, along with my fellow uh, artists in the Broadway community, I was able to create an album called Reflect for Sony Masterworks. Each song, uh, oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Um, but each song a, a vignette, a, a, a moment with these great artists to express something important that they were feeling during the pandemic. And I was really, um, it was the great thrill of my life to get to um, collaborate with them and, and, and have these important songs put into the world. Yeah. You talked about the genesis of Next to Normal, that Brian had the original idea or sort of sketched out the original story. How much, I mean, you're talking about 1998 was the first version it was 10 or 11 years before it wound up on Broadway. How much did it change over that time? And when you came on board, did you have opinions about story beats? Like, did you ever think, well, maybe this scene could go this way as opposed to that way? Um, well, my collaboration with Brian is 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 wonderful. And um, like any marriage, it has its ups and downs and its fights and its and its great moments of, of coming together. Um, and um, he, he was, uh, he it was just very collaborative. So I was able to give thoughts on story, and I have a joke in there: the um, smoke a bowl and and um, jam on Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. That's my joke. I try to get at least one joke in every show that we're doing. <laughs> and um, so so yeah, he uh, he would ask questions, and we really uh, a lot changed because we started in the wrong way. We started writing songs without an outline. So we had all of these songs. There are many, many songs for Next Normal, some of which are OK. And, and uh, some of the cut songs are It's good that they never found their way into the show. <laughs> but we, we then, thankfully, had wonderful collaborators along the way when, when David Stone and Second Stage and, of course, the great Michael Greif uh, came to the show and started to whittle away at it and, and really get to the, the crux of what the show wanted to be. Because I think when we started, the show was a little bit more in the world of a, of, of a fantastical, um, almost satirical tone at times. And uh, so it was originally called Feeling Electric. And I think there was a journey from Feeling Electric to Next to Normal. And that's when the piece really found itself. Mm -hmm. You talked about going about it not the right way. Or, you know, um, what is the right way? I mean, for those of us who don't write musical theater, how does one begin, especially when you're collaborating with a book and lyricist writer, as opposed to creating it all yourself? Well, there's really no right way, like anything. It's an imperfect science. And, and I think the, the first thing is an idea that sings. And there are going to be some people that tell you that's not an idea that sings. There were plenty of people who thought the original idea behind Next to Normal was not um, a, a good idea for a musical. And 
Brian and I just knew that it was something that spoke to us, something that we were inspired by, something that we all, I'm sure everyone in this room has someone in their life, an experience uh, th that the story touches. So uh, while it's not autobiographical, we had our own experience to bring to it. And I think that's the most important thing at first. What is something that's inspiring you? What is something that you feel like your voice can be lent to uh, and you want to put into the world? And then I think, as opposed to what we did with Next to Normal, you start to outline it and, and get the story with possible song spotting in it so that you're starting to identify the places that you really think can sing. Um, but the great thing is that even though Next to Normal had this unorthodox development period, the initial 10 minute version, because it, it began in this, in, in this wonderful workshop, the BMI Lehman Engel Musical Theater Workshop, and we, as an assignment, we're asked to create a 10 minute musical. And this was the story that we came up with for that 10 minute musical. There's a lot that's in common in terms of just the basic arc of the story. And Aftershocks, I Dreamed a Dance, and there's a little musical moment in the second act called Second in Years where she says, and you're not a scary rock star anymore. Those three moments are from the original 10 minute musical in 1998. So we were onto something. And, and even though there were some people who questioned the idea. There were plenty of people who said, keep going. There's, you've struck a nerve. This, this could be something really special for the both of you. And thankfully, we had that. And are, are there certain sort of structural things that musicals have in common that you sort of have to, I mean, you always hear this, this famous phrase, the 11 o'clock number, for instance. Are there certain things that you know that you need to do, and you have to figure out how to do it for a specific musical? Or does each musical really start as a clean slate? I think they start as a clean slate, but you're trying to hit those moments. And you talk about an 11 o'clock number uh, based on when musicals would reach this point. They don't start at the same time anymore, so I don't know if it's really the 11 o'clock number, the 10, 15 number, but it's, it's this big moment of your, of your character's awakening, um, clarity, um, kind of the, the want, the, the, the main thing that you've set in motion coming to some kind of resolution. So if you were going to look if we were going to look at a want moment and i think all the characters have them but i miss the mountains in the first act which was gargantuan this afternoon it's just so beautiful um, and uh, so this moment where diana says i, I want to feel real things I'm, I'm i'm something is not right when at the end of psychopharmacology she says i don't feel anything and the psychopharmacologist says patient stable and diana sings i i, I want to go back to something where I'm feeling real emotions. Um, how is she going to get there knowing that there's a health issue at the center of all this, that there has to be a, a responsible regimen for this character? And, and a lot of that work that we did was in the medicine of it. And again, because it's a musical and it's a story, you have to allow for the dramatic license of it while still being true to what is possible and true to, um, especially for, for the people that are living with this, to be, um, uh, to be meeting the story in the way that it needs to be met. Um, but I think that getting Diana to a place at the end when she sings so anyway, and I also look at the 11 o'clock number in many ways as maybe, um, which is that, again, Gar just beautifully performed, but the moment of Natalie and Diana when they uh, when they read, they see common ground, and she sings, "I don't." Uh, Natalie sings, "I don't need a life that's normal. That's way too far away." But something next to normal would be okay. Um, in many ways, to me, that's the that's the culmination. But uh, Brian beautifully teases the story out, and and then you get to, of course, the moment of of Dan, um, father and son, seeing one another, and and the first time Brian mapped that out and sketched it out and I saw it in the script. Uh, I didn't quite know what, what it was going to feel like and when we saw it in performance, I was a mess. I just mm -hmm. fell apart watching that as I did today. So um, all of these things though come together unexpectedly. You just keep going and keep having wonderful collaborators asking questions. Have you realized this? Have you, do you really think that this, even the, the light at the end, which was a big rewrite for um, after second stage, to be able to hear Dan getting help for for some uh, for, for some narrative about where Diane is and that she's okay, uh, these were questions that we hadn't answered until we really got to the last version of the show. Mm. 
how much did audiences teach you along the way in terms of refining the work? They definitely taught us. Uh, at second stage, the, the, uh, the, the theater, the Tony Kaiser Theater where we were, um, has similar to this, um, the, the, all of the aisles and rows uh, right in front of the theater, but then there's, a, there's sort of a side view area and you can see, you can sort of watch, say from over there, all of the people. <laughs> And we had a song called Feeling Electric at the end of the first act, which was the, taking that rock star idea to its probably too much <laughs> um, of a place. And we used to watch the after Light in the Dark, the, the audiences would, would be sort of on the edge of their seat and really paying attention. Then during Feeling Electric, you just sort of watch them go, hmm. <laughs> and you just, we lost them. Not everyone, but we lost the, enough to, to say, this is not working. And it was Michael Greif who said, have you ever thought about ending the first act with a light in the dark? And we weren't ready to do that second stage, but we did it when we went to Arena Stage in DC, and it played beautifully. But that was something the audience helped teach us about. And certainly, you'll have uh, individual audiences, audience members come up and give you opinions, and those you take and leave. Some, some are useful, some are not useful. But as a collective, as an audience, you can feel if they're laughing in the right place, if they're quiet in the right place, if people are fidgeting, if, if suddenly there's a lot of coughing going on and it sounds like you've lost them a little bit. So you take all that in and, and then just try to sort of focus into what you think is best moving forward. Mm. You, you described earlier your partnership with Brian being sort of a creative marriage. I, I wonder what is it specifically about his sensibility or your sensibility that attracts you to each other and keeps, keeps that collaborative relationship alive and, and evolving. I mean, it's still going on, obviously. I think that Brian sees the world in a way that feels so familiar to me and so visceral, and yet he puts it into words and ideas that I'm discovering what those feelings are. So as a collaborator with Brian, he teaches me about the world and about being an artist, and then I get to try and rise up to that gesture and I hope, give him that same thing in return. Mm. Does the process change for you when you're working with a totally different lyricist? Every uh, process is, especially with a musical, it has, its, has its challenges and its great discoveries. And I think that I've been lucky that I've worked with a number of phenomenal writers. And I've learned from that process in every case. Um, and it's not going to be the same thing. It's going to be its own special uh, collaboration. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when an artist achieves the remarkable success that you have, uh, it can sort of seem retrospectively as if it was inevitable. But of course, when you're young and you're struggling, it never feels inevitable. And I wonder, I, I bring this up because I know that your Broadway debut, High Fidelity, closed after just 13 performances. And I wonder... You can say the word flopped. Flopped. <laughs> but I wonder as an artist how you dealt with that, how you bounced back from that. I mean, that's, that's, that must have caused some deal of heartache and professional disappointment. And, and yet, just a few years later, Next to Normal is on Broadway. You win the Tony Award, the Pulitzer Prize. How did you weather that period in your career? Well, that was very difficult because my first child, Michael, was... Uh, 18 months at the time of High Fidelity and Rita and I had really thrown all of our belief in terms of the next part of our life into the success of that and when it didn't happen. And the truth is writing a Broadway musical um, to, to really earn a living as a writer you need your show to be profitable because that's how you, when a show is running and it's very profitable then you're seeing income stream, you're seeing royalties from that, but when a show is not profitable, and I've had shows run on Broadway where I've waived my royalties to keep the show running because it's sort of, it's just very close to break even. Um, and if a show's not successful, you immediately start waiving your royalties and then you see how long mm -hmm. it's, you want your show to run as, as long as possible, especially because there are things beyond the initial production. There's licensing and there are regional productions. So the more your show can be out in the world, the better. Um, but for High Fidelity, it was, uh, it, it was just, it just stopped. And whatever income there was had, had happened already because a Broadway show is four or five years in the making, so you get an advance early on. Um, and sometimes it's, uh, you get periodic payments, but in terms of really living, you need the show to be a success. So at that point, 
we were very scared. And jobs that I thought that I had left behind, I had to go back and see if I could, I could get hired again. I played piano bar, I was teaching. Um, and also, I think first time out, you just wonder if, if you're going to be able to make a career for yourself. But the truth is that that initial uh, worry, that, that, that um, the sort of tumultuous and sort of high and low aspect of working in the theater as a writer, it never goes away. I've had wonderful, like next to normal, unexpected joys, and then I've had uh, disappointments. And each time, you don't know what's going to happen. And um, I've certainly had to, in a, in a similar way to High Fidelity, sort of pick myself up and say, this is a career. I'm in this because I want to be a writer, and I want to experience all of it. And and just keep going and, and finding stories that matter to me, stories that I want to tell in the world. And if you can try to take everything else out of it and just focus on who you want to be as an artist and to make sure that the experience of creating that show is as joyous and as illuminating as possible, then you hope that you set yourself up with enough that you'll weather anything. Hmm. You also do a lot of arranging and orchestrating, I know, um, including major projects like Jagged Little Pill and Green Day's American Idiot. I'm wondering, what is it about orchestrating and arranging that you find compelling? Well, especially when you get to orchestrate and arrange on albums and with artists that you grew up there, with their posters on your wall and <laughs> reading the, the lyrics on your vinyl, which I have plenty of vinyl. And I, apparently vinyl is making a big comeback, or maybe already has made a comeback. Um, but I love, I love creating, and I love learning. And if I get to be inside of someone else's, uh, someone else's writing and, and see how that function works for them and then see how it affects my arranging, orchestrating, that's always a great gift. And, and what's been wonderful is that, whether it's been SpongeBob or American Idiot, I, I feel great ownership on the creativity of that because I know I've brought something really personal to the work. And as long as you do that, you kind of lose a little bit the sight of what, what, what it all sort of breaks down as, but you're just doing something that is highly creative and, and, and um, it's just very inspirational. Mm -hmm. I think particularly with Jagged Little Pill, it's so iconic. I mean, if, if you're of my age or your age, you remember where <laughs> you were when you first heard You Ought to Know. And uh, I looked it up, I knew it was successful, but it's like the third or fourth largest selling album of all time by a female recording artist. When it has, so it has a really built-in fan base. Did you have any sense of like a special responsibility to when it came to orchestrating that because of the number of people who have this relationship with the music already? I absolutely did. And it, it was the same with American Idiot because especially in adapting a beloved album like that that's already a masterpiece, every, if anything that you do that deviates, people are going to know that it's you. And so if they're not happy, they're going to blame you. So I felt a great responsibility, but also for these artists to give their uh, th this important work to um, to th theater and to say, "Here's my baby, and now now take it and 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 I trust you to see what you'll what you'll bring, what new life it will have." Um, I just every gesture is a combination of a spark of creation and also just real thought about is this the right thing. And thankfully, you have workshops and you have uh, times to, testing ground to really see. But you take a song like You Ought to Know, thankfully, we, uh, and it was a whole team effort to create that moment in the show and design it and, and realize it in the way that we did. And performance, uh, everything, um, Lauren Patton um, creating that, that, that moment um, it was uh, it was unbelievable, and the first night we did it in the theater, the audience leapt to their feet, and I thought, well, it's the first preview. So, mm -hmm. and then it kept happening, and it kept happening, and it happened on Broadway, and uh, it was what I was scared of most because that song already spoke to people in such a visceral way. But thankfully, we were able to find its version in the show that had that power, and I think that's that's what you try to do. You try to find something new in what exists, but also pay huge um, respect to, uh, to the composition and what makes it so iconic. 
And, and does that kind of work feed back to your own work as a composer? I mean, does it make you rethink how you compose, or are they sort of like separate spheres? They definitely, uh, definitely comes back and in influences me. The song at the top of Act Two, which is called Wish I Were Here, came right out of my American Idiot time with Green Day. And I remember I was musical directing the show 13, um, Jason Robert Brown's wonderful musical that's going to be on Netflix, I'm so happy to see. Um, but I took the, the band, which was all teenagers, the whole, the, I was the only adult in the, in the orchestra, and I said, would you all mind just trying something out with me? So me and the 13 band tried Wish I Were Here for the first time, and, um, and it was thrilling to play it with them, but it was directly out of American Idiot, which I had just started working on at that time. Wow, that's so interesting. Um, I want to quickly ask, I know you collaborated with Lin-Manuel Miranda on Bring It On, and um, you both wrote the music. Was it a case of you wrote some songs and he wrote others, or are you actually working on the songs together? It started that way. It started out as um, specific assignments, but what was wonderful is that along with Amanda Green, who also wrote lyrics, we started to just mix and match, and, and, and there were songs that the three of us wrote together. Uh, there was a song, the opening number, I remember uh, going with Lynn, um, um, just just sort of going out of New York City and, and and spending the day with him and writing the opening number, coming up with ideas. Um, and what was also special about that day was Lynn, Lynn said, I have these demos I'd love to play for you. And they were early <laughs> Hamilton demos. <laughs> what did you think when you heard them? I thought, wow. <laughs> <laughs> this is unbelievable. And, um, and it was just such a beautiful moment that, that he shared it with me. And, and again, when you talk about how you see something early on and then suddenly you're on stage mm -hmm. to see those songs come to life. But um, at that point, it was, the idea was a mixtape that, that he was working with, a, a, a sort of a concept album that um, obviously with, with his brilliant collaborators mm -hmm. became um, the musical of all time. So mm -hmm. that I got a little, little peek into that was, was quite a thrill. Were you put together with him as like by a producer had an idea you two should work together or do you know each other beforehand like how do how do those collaborations I mean, obviously you met Brian in college yeah. but how do some of these other collaborations happen well Lynn and I got to know each other because uh, High Fidelity and In the Heights were produced by the same producers so we were hanging around each other starting around 2005 and um, and then Andy Blankenbuehler who choreographed both In the Heights and Hamilton and directed and choreographed Bring It On, just called me one day and said, we're putting together a team for Bring It On the Musical. And, um, and Lynn was already attached at that point. And Andy told me about how it would work, sort of the concept of, of the score. And I, was, I thought, yes, please, let me, in, let me into that room. And um, I knew that I was going to um, be inspired being in that room, but I was also going to learn quite a bit. Um, and, um, and Lynn and I were, were, were friends at that time just from being around one another, but we, we, we became really close through that experience. And, um, and that, of course, also led to us writing that, that big zany Tony number in 2013 for Neil Patrick Harris, <laughs> which um, the two of us were with, with Rita and Vanessa Lynn's wife were back in the orchestra, and we just <laughs> didn't know what was happening. And we literally just started hugging each other and jumping around after the number, because in, in rehearsal, it never went as well as it did in, in the performance. How many times has that happened? So we got mm -hmm. lucky. I think it was the first time the magic trick actually worked. Uh, before we open up to the audience, I just want to ask you a little bit about your work on um, the plays of Shakespeare. You've scored three productions, is that correct, with Shakespeare in the Park in New York, Winter's Tale, All's Well, That Ends Well, and Cymbeline. And I, what specifically does it take to work on texts like Shakespeare's that is so inherently and insistently musical in and of itself? You know what I mean? Well, it's, it's a concept, and, and it's the director, Michael Greif and, and Dan Sullivan, both sat me down and took me through the text and, and talked every single musical cue that they had in mind and what the tonality behind it was meant to be. And in some cases, there were songs. I wrote four songs for Cymbeline. Um, and so that was huge to just be able to go down the list and have a sense as to what, what they were looking for. And then I literally sat in the rehearsal room and just would write music on the piano as I was watching. And um, that was, I think, in every case, how it sort of happened. And I would have a little recorder there and, or just make notes. And then I would go off and I would flesh it out and I would come up with themes. 
And they were all very different in terms of the, the, the score and, and, and what they sounded and felt like. But um, you know going into it there's going to be 40 to 50 musical cues because of all the transitions and the underscoring. Mm -hmm. And it was a great lesson for me uh, just to underscore in a way that allows you to be dramatic and allows you to be telling story, but staying out of the way of the text and never infringing on the audience's understanding of what's being said. So I would say anyone, for a composer who wants to learn the art of underscoring, doing any Shakespeare production will, will teach you quite a lot. Fantastic. Um, this production of Next to Normal was supposed to open two years ago on this yeah. stage. Um, and we were lucky that we were able to hold on to the team and bring everyone here to, to kind of, you know, rebirth the theater a little bit here in Westport. And I know you had a similar experience of flying over Sunset at Lincoln Center, which I <clears throat> mentioned when I was introducing you. And what was it like to uh, finally get that up and running after this long, long delay? It's hard to really put into words what the last two years have been. Uh, I, I think we all have our own version of that. Uh, I would just say, as, as an artist who was about to realize a few different things in the spring of 2020, and then to just watch right at that moment, especially for, for Flying Over Sunset, that was literally at its first preview on March 12th, 2020, and then to, to pause and to have to get through, um, as a parent, uh, the, the, the most uncertain and nervous um, and um, just hard to fathom part of your life and, and, and see how you not know when and if these things come back and um, and just try to 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 create, even mm -hmm. though I didn't have any impulse to do so at first, uh, and to keep my kids hopeful and and looking forward, um, and then to come back after that time, and in some ways feel like you never left, and in some ways feel like you've been gone for years and years and years, um, and then just as you're ready, there's a new surge. And, um, and there's testing and there's people who are um, having to isolate and there's small audiences because people are, are, are afraid. And, um, and then there's a cast recording and then there's fuller audiences and then there's celebration again. Um, and all of this is happening in real time and you're just trying to catch up to it emotionally. Um, and now I look back on the fall, and I'm some of it I remember, and some of it feels almost like a dream um, to watch a show that was teched and was about to preview, and then see it pick up again, as if as if you just press play on a on a cassette player. It was um, it's unlike anything, and what I tried to do in every moment, and I continue to do, and I felt that today. It's just live in gratitude. Gratitude to be here. Gratitude that my kids who were too young when Next to Normal opened, that they got to see it. And I got to experience it with them. And my daughter who was next to me just kept looking over, seeing me crying and <laughs> holding my hand. Um, and I remember in 2020 when I heard about this production, I was so excited to come see it. And here we are two years later and I got to experience it. And I would say, as I've thought with everything, no matter what the entirety of the experience was, I feel like after all of this, it was well worth the wait. And with that, I'd love to open it up to the audience. If anyone has a question they would love to ask of Tom, um, yes.
Did everyone hear that question? Okay, just wanting to know what research was involved in sort of fleshing out this picture of bipolar disorder and how it affects an entire family. Uh, that's a really good question. And um, as you can imagine, there was a ton of research. Uh, Brian read a number of books. Um, we are, are lucky that we have um, a lot of doctors in our life who, who are close to us. And so there were a lot of conversations, a lot of questions about um, the... Um, you know, how, what 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 the if this, what this would actually be as a as a story if this were happening in in, in a real situation, um, and even uh, there, it was years before we settled on uh, Gabe's uh, what what had happened um, and how old he would have been, um, but it was so important to get everything right, at least in a way that we felt we could stand behind because I know that there are some people. Who, who see next to normal and they say um, that's that's too much, or there are some people who say it doesn't go far enough. It's 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 the sweet spot of it is I'm affected by that story and I and I and and, and that is all that 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 could be a narrative, um, and um, and to do that we just had to make sure that we kept asking questions, kept doing the research, um, and allowing people to come see it and weigh in and point out any place where we needed to do more research and more work. Um, other questions? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, first of all, unbelievably great score. I think it should win a prize. <laughs> um, in the transition from Broadway to sending it out to schools and regional theaters, is there stuff you had to do to the orchestration, to the dialogue, to the set design? How different is this from Broadway in the, in the package? Uh, it's it's pretty accurate from from what we did, um, and uh, every production um, can uh, can t uh, we're licensed through um, MTI, which is M Musical Theater International, and we so we licensed through that, and all the orchestrations, even the track that was at the top of Act Two, I I was reminded as I was hearing it, I created that. Uh, for the Broadway production, and I gave it to MTI to, um, if anyone wants to use this, or they can create their own, because there's sheet music for it too. You could follow it, you could create your own track. Um, and so it's really, um, it's, it's really accurately depicted in terms of what we did, the six piece orchestrations that Michael Starabin and I did. Um, and, um, but this production today, there were, there were a few, we, we, we received a, a, a Gorgeous, beautiful, heartfelt letter um, about uh, a few a few suggestions, um, and Brian and I were, were were incredibly moved by the letter, and of course immediately wrote back and said, "Please um, incorporate whatever it is that's going to make this production, in this version, personal." Um, and and those little touches were were just glorious today. So I, I was really um, so moved, and and I felt lucky that I was able to be watching this production today and feeling, as I said, new touches, new, um, uh, new, new moments that, that, as I said, re reduced me to a puddle of tears. Is there an example of a change that you saw um, there, were, um, there were a couple of references. Um, there, uh, in, in Didn't I See This Movie, um, there were a few different, um, uh, in the, um, in, I can't remember which verse. We've, we've, we've played with that song so many times. Um, but there were, there were a couple of different um, references um, for artists that were mentioned. Um, and I think there was also, um, in the second act, I think in, in, in Didn't I, um, no, we said Didn't I say this movie, in um, the reprise of, of uh, You Don't Know, there was, um, there was also um, a change in, in a reference that, um, again, I thought was a, a wonderful touch. All right, thank you. Um, yes.
Sean Kate really brought me to tears, especially when he put it out again. Yeah. Well, that was, and that was exactly the process. Um, and, um, and I was moved to tears as well in that moment, and so many. Um, but that was the, there, there was a, a, just a, a, a beautifully detailed letter about some of those changes and what it would mean to this story um, and this production. And, um, and as soon as we got that letter and read it, we immediately wrote back and said, yes, please go forth with all of that. That will be beautiful. And I couldn't wait to be here today to see um, to see all those changes in performance, and they were they were all so moving and, and so perfect. If time for one more question, if I'll, yes, on the aisle there. <laughs> thank you for for that. Thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> I'll <laughs> wonderful too. Let me let me uh yeah, let me come say hello. Thank you very much to all of you for sticking around this afternoon, and thank you to our guest, Tom Kitt, for his time and his talents. We appreciate it immensely. Thank, thank you, you all very much. Thank you.